This is our sixth lesson in our current series titled, Be Humble or Be Humble. And like our last study, we want to see what pride looks like up close and personal by observing it in a person's life. Thus today, we'll examine a portrait of pride in the life of an Old Testament Babylonian ruler by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar. So let me invite you to take your Bibles and open them with me to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Now complete this sentence with me. The hardest element in presenting someone the gospel is, fill in the blank. The hardest element in presenting someone the gospel is, fill in the blank. Now what I would personally propose to you that the number one answer for this fill in are the two words, getting started. I believe oftentimes the hardest element in presenting someone the gospel is getting started. Now that answer may be due to the fear of man, which brings a snare and hangs us up at times in giving the, someone the gospel because we're afraid of their reaction or maybe their rejection. But at other times, it's not the fear of man, but it's a matter of how to turn the conversation wisely to spiritual things. So may I suggest, when it comes to presenting the gospel, that one of the easiest ways to get started is to share your own testimony. You need to look for an opening or an opportunity to share your own personal testimony of how you came to place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. People like to hear stories. People like to hear about other people's lives, oftentimes. And it's an easy way to get started. But this all assumes that you do have a personal testimony of how you were saved. This assumes that you are already a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that your destiny has been changed from a hell you deserve to a heaven you don't, that you've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. For there's no such thing as, I've always been a Christian. Or I've always been saved. Or I've always believed. Usually when people tell me that, the majority of the time they aren't saved and they don't understand the gospel yet. For Because in every person's life who is saved, there was a past, there was a point in time when they came in contact with the gospel, there was a point in time when they believed that message for themselves so that they now know for sure they're going to heaven. So do you have a personal testimony? Is it thought through? Is it logical? Is it sequential? Does it clearly present the gospel? Is it a testimony to God's grace and not a bragamony of some human accomplishment? Does it focus your hearer on the person and work of Jesus Christ, or does it miss the mark? Now, these are important questions, friends, to consider if you desire to be a wise and faithful witness for Jesus Christ. And in our study today, we're going to read an, an amazing testimony of God's grace and a striking example of the biblical truth we have been emphasizing throughout this series, namely, be humble or be humble. Now, last time we examined the life of a saved man by the name of King Saul. He was a believer in the Lord. He was the first king of Israel who began his service with humility, but whose life was devastated due to pride. And now today we want to examine the pride and arrogance of an unsaved man who will come to know the Lord and who was the most powerful man in his day, 
who had to learn the hard way, the biblical truth, be humble or be humble. And his name is King Nebuchadnezzar. To put Daniel chapter 4, where we will be studying today, into its historical context, let me briefly review Daniel's ch chapters 1, 2, and 3. You see, in doing so, we covered some incidents leading up to Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. And the year was 606 <coughs> B.C. For many years preceding, the two southern tribes called Judah, who had escaped the disciplining hand of God via the Assyrians in 722 B.C., continued to backslide from God and went whoring after false gods and what the Bible calls spiritual harlotry. And God had promised under the law in Leviticus 26 and in Deuteronomy 28 that if Israel would not listen to his voice, if Israel would not repent, if Israel would not respond to him, he would discipline them with one cycle of discipline, then a second, and then a third, and then a fourth, and then even a fifth. And that fifth cycle of discipline would involve God even using a foreign country to conquer Israel and to disperse them. And to take them out of the promised land into a land of those who had conquered them. Now this national dispersion of the Jews out of the promised land actually occurred three times in Israel's history. Do you know that? The first was in 722 B.C. with God using the Assyrians to conquer the ten northern tribes, oftentimes called Israel. Then in 606 B.C., ending in 586, God used the Babylonians to come in and conquer the two southern tribes, normally referred to as Judah. And then in 70 A.D., God used the Romans to come in and conquer all 12 tribes and disperse them throughout the land and now throughout the world so that they didn't even have a nation to call themselves home, as it were, until 48 A.D. And until very recently, there were more Jews living outside the land than in the land. So when we pick up the story of Daniel, Babylon has just conquered Israel, and they began deporting from Israel to Babylon young men of royalty, <coughs> such as Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. You know, I like to call them Daniel, my shack, your shack, and a bungalow. <laughs> now these four Jewish teens knew the Lord. And they also knew the word of God. And take your hat off to their parents. They had no idea they were going to be conquered. They had no idea they'd be plucked from their home, plucked from their nation, plucked from their culture, plucked from their religious beliefs, and planted in this pagan Gentile area called Babylon. But that's exactly what happened. By the way, parents, if your teen was to be plucked today, how would they fare outside of your guidance outside of your oversight. Do, would they know how to walk with the Lord? Would they know what the will of God is? Would they have some backbone and conviction? Well, these teenagers did, and they were put to the test right away in Daniel chapter 1, and they not only passed the test with flying colors, but they were promoted in the Babylonian government because of it. And then in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a troubling dream which he demanded that his magicians and astrologers and sorcerers would not only make known to him, because he forgot what it was, but also to interpret it, which they could not, for they were not true prophets of God. But Daniel could, and Daniel did, by God's enablement. And Daniel was quick to give God the glory for the fact that God had revealed to him both the dream and the interpretation thereof. And he refused to take the credit. He gave God the glory for he walked in humility. And so he approaches Nebuchadnezzar 
and he accurately articulates both the dream and the interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar, who remembered then his dream and affirmed Daniel's accuracy in doing so. Now, what was this dream about? Well, it was about a statue in which God made known the coming times of the Gentile ruling over the nation of Israel. First through Babylon, which was already occurring, then medial Persia, Greece, Rome, and eventually a revived Roman Empire, which is yet to come. For our purposes, we pick it up in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 36. Daniel 2, verse 36. Daniel says, this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you, notice who gave him? His kingdom, the God of heaven. And not only a kingdom, but power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven. He has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, which we will understand later to be the medial Persia kingdom. And then another, a third ruler of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, namely Greece. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others, namely Rome. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And by the way, the truth of these upcoming kingdoms are also set forth in Daniel chapter 7 to reaffirm all of this. Verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they shall, will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the last set of kings here, this ten toes, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. And we know now this will be when Jesus returns, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to, one, to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron and bronze and clay and the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. And then Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, now watch this, very important, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Now please know, it's your God, though. It's not his God. And you know, he was a polytheist. He would believe in many gods, normal Babylonian religion. And yes, they may even acknowledge another god. We'll add them to the group. But notice, it isn't Nebuchadnezzar's god. He does not know the Lord. He is not a saved man, though he's recognizing Daniel's god at this point. We continue. Verse 48, then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. And so we see here, again, that... God was working out his will 
to accomplish his objective and actually reveal through a dream what would transpire in history. For dear friends, don't ever forget, history is his story. And God is still on the throne. Now, unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar, in light of what is said, doesn't give God the glory to his name, doesn't embrace him personally, but instead in chapter 3, we read that he, he builds an idol, a big statue of gold. And by the way, who was the head of gold? Nebuchadnezzar. And therefore, this is probably a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And unlike Daniel, who gave God the glory and responded in humility, Nebuchadnezzar became arrogant and puffed up. And what did he then do? Verse 1 of chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, and its width 6 cubits. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And, and so they did. Verse 4, then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery and symphony, with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time when all the people heard the sound of all those instruments, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to the King Nebuchadnezzar, O King, live forever. You, O King, have made a decree that everyone who hears the band striking up, I'm just going to shorten it there, okay? shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And there are certain Jews who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image, which you have set up. And then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, now keep in mind, he, he's, he's very proud. Very arrogant. And what do proud people do when things don't go their way? They get really angry. And that's exactly what's happening here. And so he threatens, verse 15. Now if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the, the band striking up, and, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, said to the king, and I love this, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, if you throw us into the fiery furnace, our God, not his God, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, if God does not choose to deliver us, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Now that isn't arrogance, that's conviction. And they recognized their first responsibility was to the Lord, never to the king. Only to the king is on to the Lord. And the king was now asking them something contrary to the will of God. Therefore, they must obey God rather than man. 
And they were prepared to die to do it. And they knew that God could deliver them if he so chose. But if not, they were not bowing the knee. Now keep in mind that these men were not bowing the knee prior to the music either. It's just that when the music came out and everyone else bowed down, they became obvious. And I would dare say, isn't that what happens in our day? And in fact, as the world keeps bowing down to the thinking of the world, believers who have conviction become more obvious and become more the target, oftentimes, of the wrath of the unsaved and persecution and so forth and so forth. And this is exactly what will happen here. And yet we know the rest of the story that he gets, they get thrown into the fiery furnace and it's heated seven times hotter than it should have been. And in doing so, as Nebuchadnezzar is looking in, he sees not three, but actually four. One like the Son of God there in the midst. And that these men are not harmed, neither is even a hair on their head singed. Because you see, the Lord had said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. And as a result, Nebuchadnezzar has to acknowledge this. And so we read in verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Notice, again, it's their God, not his, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language who speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other god who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. But notice again, it's, it's their God. It's not his God. But in Daniel chapter 4, there is a tremendous transformation that occurs. And as a result, we are able to read the personal testimony of King Nebuchadnezzar and how he was brought to know personally and to embrace by faith personally the true and living God. There's an introduction in verses 1 through 3 that we need to read. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It sounds like one of Paul's epistles here. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God, notice not your God, but now it's the Most High God, has worked for me. This is a personal testimony. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, this is an amazing chapter of the scriptures, friends. And remember that it was written by a Babylonian Gentile king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. If you notice closely, it's I thought. I, Nebuchadnezzar. It's first person singular. So when you're thinking of the writers of scripture, we usually think of Moses and David and Solomon and Isaiah and Ezekiel and so forth. But make sure to add to the list Nebuchadnezzar. This is his testimony, probably a royal proclamation that was made that was then incorporated by Daniel into Daniel chapter 4. And he's going to tell about his pride. He's going to talk about how the Lord humbled him. He's going to explain how the Lord brought him to understand who he was by faith. And frankly, it's a great testimony to the truth of Scripture. Because who wants to admit they've been arrogant? Who wants to admit they've been proud? Who wants to admit God had to humble them? Who wants to eat crow? Nobody. 
and then write it down, proclaim it throughout the whole land, and make it part of the Word of God. You know this has to be done by the inspiration of Scripture because by nature we would never want to admit those things. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, including Daniel chapter 4, written by a Gentile Babylonian king and incorporated into the very word of God. Now what was this testimony like? Notice eight characteristics in these three verses. Number one, it was widespread. For he wanted everyone to know it. He says in verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. You see, it is very normal when someone is saved by the grace of God that they want others to know. They're concerned about other people's destinies. When people say they're saved and they have no burden for the lost, something is wrong there. By the way, do you have a burden for the lost? Do you have a desire? to share the gospel. And oftentimes, the first place that shows itself is usually with your, your own family. Secondly, this testimony was given in a very respectful way. It was respectful. For he was warm in his greeting. He says, peace be multiplied to you. Very friendly, very respectful, very polite, no reason to be rude when giving your testimony to others, though your testimony might offend them as you share the gospel with them. Thirdly, we see that this testimony was voluntary, for he was not forced to do this. You see, when it comes to your testimony, it shouldn't be that I have to, but I want to share with others what God has done for me. And what a privilege to witness for Christ with the love of Christ compelling us and the burden for the lost and their eternal destiny driving us. Fourthly, this testimony was personal for he explained what God had done for him. Notice verse 2, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Notice, it's personal. And by the way, when you're giving your testimony, it's, it's personal. It's, it's about you and what God has done for you. Now, every testimony has some common components, but they also have your own personal elements and events in it. Fifthly, we notice when it comes to this testimony that it was short. For he explains all the highlights in 37 verses. It only takes, you know, 8 to 10 minutes at the most to read. Not all the details, but key truths and events. And when you want to think about presenting your testimony, especially in an informal way, you don't want it to go on for an hour. You want to keep it shorter and to the point and share the highlights. Furthermore, this testimony explains how he came to personally know God and his grace. You see, salvation is, according to John 17, 3, oh, that I may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's what eternal life is all about. And we're going to see how God gets focused in on here and how his grace is magnified. Furthermore, this testimony explains God is sovereign and Savior of all. And that was important for Nebuchadnezzar because he was the king. He was the most powerful person in the universe. And yet his testimony does not exalt self or sin, but exalts God and his grace. There's no way to explain Nebuchadnezzar's testimony but by explaining God and what God did one last observation, in this case, this testimony was written out so that it could be stated accurately and it could even be preserved. And by the way, this is a great exercise to do. I'd encourage you to write out your testimony and then even practice it so that if you have an opportunity, you'd have some rhyme or reason about how you would present it to someone else. 
Furthermore, for example, today when we uh, get a chance to hear some testimonies of individuals at the water baptism, I always encourage everyone to write it out. Why? Because you get up there, you get stage fright, you, you get brain freeze, and it's usually said better and more accurately, including appropriate scripture, when you take the time to write it out. And so I would encourage you to do the same. You know, many believers don't witness for Jesus Christ because they haven't been trained and prepared to do so. And this is one of the ways to get the conversation started as well as to get to the gospel. Now that is a tremendous introduction. But in doing so, let's now examine the ingredients of Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. What did it consist of? What can we learn from it about God, man, life, and the problem of pride? Well, first of all, we see that he describes some details about his past that triggered a need providing a context. Some details about his past that triggered a need providing a context. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 4, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Now this was in the latter part of his life. He had been very secure from a worldly standpoint. Notice he was at rest in his house. He was flourishing in his palace. Everything seemed to be going well. And then he has this dream that made him afraid. And you know, when people get saved, they have to see a need. And when everything's going well in life, they so often don't see the need that they really do have, for if you are without Christ, you are without God, and you are on your way to hell. But when everything's going well, it's like, why do I need the Lord? And so the Lord usually uses physical, relational, or spiritual things to cause you to see a need. Physically, it might be a medical kind of thing in which you begin to realize your mortality and the fact that you need to know where you're going to spend eternity. Or it could be that some affliction has inflicted your children and it causes you to see that you need something greater than yourself and greater than the medical community. In other cases, it's relational. You might be going through a divorce or a difficult marriage or this or that, and you say, I have a need. I need the Lord. Or it could be just spiritually. That was primarily what was true of me at the age of 18. Someone opened a Bible and showed me I needed to be born again, and that if I wasn't saved, I was going to hell. And I said, I have a need. And as a result, I was open to hear what the gospel was. Well, in this case, Nebuchadnezzar sees a need. Now, that doesn't mean he sees a need for the Lord yet. But he has a need. And as a result, God can begin to show him the truth. You know, as we think of our spiritual need even to be saved, again, we recognize that God is holy, morally perfect, and without sin, and that heaven is also holy, morally perfect, and without sin. In contrast, there's you and me, and we are sinners. And the Bible says the penalty for sin is death. Death always reflects itself in some means of separation, and therefore there is this sin barrier that separated man from God. We were born separated from from God, should we die physically, we would then be eternally separated from God, <clears throat> namely in hell. And you see, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, and the penalty of sin form the context to underscore our need to be saved. And to even fear the wrath to come. And by the way, Nebuchadnezzar, in verse 5, became greatly scared because of the dream. You see, God is pursuing him, and God is rocking his boat. Why is that? Because God is not willing any should perish. 
He wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And he is the one who initiates this. He's the one who seeks us so that we then will seek him. Having described some details about his past that triggered a need, Nebuchadnezzar then discusses how he came into contact with God's truth. And we have already seen he used a dream to get his attention. And though I'm not sure he recognized it as God's work, for the natural man normally doesn't, nevertheless, God is going to use it. Verse 6. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Now, when someone has a need, they start to turn to things. And because by nature we are spiritually blind, so often we don't even know where to turn. And so sometimes people turn to astrology or they turn to New Age kind of things, or in some cases they turn to self-help books, or, and maybe they will turn to religion. But blind people don't see well, and they usually look for the truth in all the wrong places. Nebuchadnezzar, why don't you call in Daniel? You know him. He's helped you in the past. Even better, why not ask for help from Daniel's God? You've heard about him. You've even acknowledged him. But I think this is a reflection, dear friends, of his pride and his stubbornness. And human nature, when everything is going wrong, so often we're still resistant to open our heart to God in his word. And so he calls in all the cloak and dagger astrologers. Verse 7. Then the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers came in and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. And so often the unsaved turn to false teachers or the world for answers, but they repeatedly miss the mark and misdiagnose the real problem and give the wrong solution, and you're still empty on the inside. You were saved. But at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, that was his Chaldean name, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. You know, he knew something was different about Daniel from his previous encounters with him. And by the way, if we're walking with the Lord and the fruit of the Spirit is happening in our life, people will know there's something different about us. Now, that doesn't mean they'll know exactly what it is. They might just think, oh, he's really religious. You know, I just loved years ago, as a newer believer, when someone said, oh, you've really become religious, Rocky. And I would say, oh, it's not religion. I, I hate religion. And it was like, what? Well, no, I'm talking about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, not religion. Let me tell you the difference, and we were off and running. But Nebuchadnezzar knew Daniel was different by his words and by his life. And may, by God's grace, something be different by your words and by your life. Now, no one's going to get saved by just looking at your life. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. On the other hand, we can, our lives can either be a stepping stone or a stumbling block to others. Which is it? And so the unsaved at times may reject your message initially, but may seek you out later. Because they know something's different and they know you might have the answer. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar is doing. You know, if I could use a personal illustration. I remember many years ago, you know, Randy Zempel, many of you know Randy, he usually sits right up here. I, I think he got raptured today. I'm not sure where he is. <laughs> that uh, Randy and I were classmates growing up. And, and, and I got saved. And, and then the first time we witnessed to him, he said we fire hosed him. And we probably did, but uh, I think he was so shocked. Instead of seeing bottles, he saw Bibles in the back seat. And, and we gave him the gospel. Well, there you are, Randy. Hey. Hey, I didn't see you there. Hey. Yeah. 
he decided to return and join us. So. <laughs> and you know, I, we would give Randy the gospel, and he had a Lutheran background, and as a result, he thought he was a child of God through infant baptism, which you're not. And, and I remember one time, and he wasn't saved yet, he was living in St. Cloud, and he called me up, I think it was Easter, maybe Christmas. And he says, hey, Rocky, I want you to know we're going to a Bible study. I said, really? He says, yeah, at the Lutheran Church. I said, really? What are they teaching you? Oh, that you're saved by grace. I said, that's really good. What is grace? He says, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they never explained it to him. I remember another time when there was a man and his wife, who was being witnessed to by a believer from DBC, and, uh, and she had a Baptist background. And she had asked Jesus in her heart as a kid, and she was told that in order to be saved, you had to come forward. And she could never get the guts to do it. So here I was, I was talking to them, or with Nancy and, and these believer friends, and, and I explained to her that you don't have to come forward. That you just need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And I gave her the gospel. And she was mad. Now, it's funny. You would think that she would have been relieved. But she wasn't. Because this would mean she had been duped. This would mean her church tradition would have been inaccurate. See, pride gets in the way. So she gets into the car. I find this out later. She gets into the car and turns to her husband and says, Prove him wrong. So he goes to the local Christian bookstore and he buys a Ryrie Study Bible and a Strong's Concordance and some other things and begins to study. And about six weeks, six months later, he comes to her and says, Honey, he's right. And I want to start going to church. And so he did. And she didn't. She went to her Baptist church. And in doing so, he said this. What if, this is what I want you to do. You write down stuff from the sermon, and I'll write down stuff from the sermon, and then we'll compare when it's over to see what we've learned. Well, he comes back with four pages of notes, and she came back with a paragraph. And then they did it the second week, and by the second week, she says, I give up, I'll come. And by a month or so later, she was saved by the grace of God. And we have a good relationship, though they've moved away. We have a good relationship to this day. You see, sometimes people uh, reject the message at first, but later will become open. That's why when it comes to fishing, you have to see each time if the fish are biting, because they may or may not. But here we see that God used a believer, namely Daniel, to give Nebuchadnezzar the truth. Thirdly, Nebuchadnezzar now details what truths God sought to convict him about in his life. What are some of the truths that he sought to convict him about? Well, first of all, he explains the content of the dream. In verse 10, we read, <coughs> These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven, which says this comes from God. He cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots and the earth Bound with a band of iron and bronze, in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast. 
and let seven times pass over him. Now that is the content of the dream. Again, it centers around a tree. In the middle of the earth, that's the location. Its height was great. That speaks of its growth. Its coverage was worldwide. And the destiny of the tree would be that it would be cut down and become just a stump. And the stump was to be bound again with a band of iron and bronze, and its heart was to be changed from a man's to a beast until seven times it passed. And if you look closely here, there's a lot of personal pronouns used in reference to that tree. And what was the purpose of the dream, verse 17? This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones. In order that, here's the purpose, the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest, lowest of men. Now if you were to summarize this, it's so that the living may know the sovereign grace of God. The God is sovereign, and he even gives kingdoms to the lowest of men, which certainly underscores grace. That's why at times, even when it comes to certain presidents in the United States, you might ask, how did they get in? Or, man, da-da-da-da-da. Just remember that God is still on the throne, and sometimes he gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. God is in control. But that's the purpose of the dream. That's the intent. Now all of this raises the question, so what does this mean? And so thirdly, he explains the interpretation of the dream in verses 18 through 26. In verse 18 we read, This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now by the way, how would you like to be in Daniel's sandals telling the most powerful man on the earth how God was going to cut him down to size. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar could have his head cut off, and he wouldn't even know it until he tried to sneeze. I mean, this would <laughs> happen fast. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdoms are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, why? Once again, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. He says, you've, you've hit the head, the nail on the head. That's the dream I had. Now tell me what it means. Verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time. Now astonished means he was blown away. He was like, whoa, Nelly, you know, here. And his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation concern your enemies. But unfortunately, it wasn't. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, you know, he's building it up to the, to the punchline, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelled, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens had their home. It is you, O king, who have, become, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness is grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven. And seven times shall pass over you, seven years, 
Tell you no, here's the point, that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as he, they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you. You're not going to lose your kingdom, ultimately. After you come to know that heaven rules. That's what he needed to know. He needed to know that heaven, the God of heaven, the one and true living God, is the one who rules. Therefore, let me give you some practical advice. O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins, namely, make a break from your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. And so he's telling him in a very practical way, one, God is the one who is sovereign and he is gracious. He's the one who set you up in your kingdom. And secondly, you've got a sin problem. And again, remember, the context is always again the fact that God is holy. We are sinners. The penalty is death. Judgment is coming. We need to escape the wrath of God. And he's seeking to drill this home, as it were, into Daniel's thinking. Now notice how Daniel spoke the, love, the truth with love, but he wasn't afraid. He tell the truth even to the king. And sometimes we shrink in fear because we're afraid that our message will be rejected. And we need to recognize that while we don't need to go out of our way to offend someone, and we don't need to say, I must have not been clear they didn't get offended. No, no. Uh, on the other hand, we know that the gospel does offend, and especially offends religious types. And therefore, he not only gives the interpretation, verse 27, he makes the application to his life. And that's why we need to do that as well. We need to make that application. We need to, as it were, expose and to invite people to come to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And so once you've gone over again the bad news, God is holy. The penalty for sin is death. We are sinners. Deserving of the wrath of God. Separated from Him. And that it's not a matter of getting our good to away our bad. For all our righteousness are like filthy rags. And therefore, if God gave us what we deserved, He would send us to hell. We need to explain again clearly the bad news. But then we want to move beyond that, obviously, to explain the good news and how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but would have everlasting. And we have a wonderful message to proclaim. But we know in preaching this message that religious people will be offended or they will need to be humbled by virtue of the fact that you have to admit that all the things you've ever done that you thought gained favor with God could not save you. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And you see, pride is what hinders people from going to heaven. It's pride that causes them to cling to those filthy rags and the human righteousness and their religious works and rituals and their traditions. Instead of changing their mind and putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, as a witness, you just proclaim the message. You can't make people believe it. But that doesn't mean you can't invite them to believe it. And one of the easiest ways is just put their name in John 3.16 and ask them if they believe that, if this is now true for them. And so, in this testimony, Daniel descri or Nebuchadnezzar describes some details about his past that triggered a need. 
He discusses how he came in contact with God's truth. He details what truths God sought to convict him about in his life. And then fourthly, he delineates the events that led to his salvation conversion. He gives us a few details about what brought him, as it were, to his knees and to put his faith in the true and living God. And the first thing he underscores is having heard the truth, how God patiently gave him a period of grace. Verse 28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar, just like God said, and at the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon, and the king spoke, saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. This guy is not getting it. This guy is not humbling himself. This guy is not embracing what Daniel told him a year ago. And not always, but normally, God gives people a period of grace having heard the gospel, to believe in it. In fact, some people, before they die, have heard the gospel many times. There's no excuse. Even if you've heard it one time, there's no excuse. And there's no guarantee that you'll be given a year. In fact, if you would read closely the very next chapter, Daniel chapter 5, you will realize that Nebuchadnezzar's grandson became the ruler, and in one night, having heard the truth of God's coming judgment, that judgment happened that very night because he would not humble himself even though he knew the story of what God did with his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. You see, for here was Nebuchadnezzar glorying in himself, glorying in his accomplishment, thinking it was all about him, get, being given a period of grace, but he was unwilling to change his mind. And by the way, let me just say even to believers that oftentimes when you sin and you walk in carnality, God gives you a period of grace before he disciplines you. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 11. He gives us a time usually for self-judgment. But some believers are just so hell-bent on doing it their way and, and having their will done that God gives them grace and they think they're getting away with it. And then God chastens them and disciplines them. And so having heard the truth, God patiently gave him a period of grace. Secondly, we note, having refused the truth, God quickly declares and delivers his judgment upon him. God quickly declares and delivers his judgment upon him. Verse 31. While the word was still in the king's mouth, boasting about himself, a voice fell from heaven. What did it say? King Nebuchadnezzar. To you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. Just like Daniel had said. And they shall drive you from men. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times shall pass over you. Until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. And gives it to whomever he chooses. And guess what? That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Now this is a pretty incredible result. Now, Reynolds Showers writes, and I quote, Skeptics have scoffed at the account of Nebuchadnezzar's mental illness in Daniel. They have claimed that it's preposterous to believe that such a thing happened to such a mighty king. However, 
a Greek writer named Megathesis, who lived from 312 to 280 BC, related an interesting story that had been told to him by the Chaldeans. According to this story, after he had completed military conquest, Nebuchadnezzar, quote, was possessed by some god or other while on the roof of his palace. The story also talked about a man driven through the desert where wild beasts sought their food, a lonely wanderer among the rocks and ravines. And although this story differed in several respects from the account in Daniel, the similarities were strong enough to have prompted the conclusion that the Chaldean account to Megathesis was a perversion of what actually happened to Nebuchadnezzar. In addition, it's interesting to note that for four years, Nebuchadnezzar's name disappeared from the historical and governmental records of Babylon. It reappeared for a brief time before the king died. You see, he experiences this, this state. In fact, I believe one writer calls it boanthropy, in which he had beast-like condition. He, he was shot. He was eating grass. This guy was insane, as it were. And what was it all due to, friends? His pride, and therefore his unbelief. Be humble or be humbled, and that's exactly what's happening here. So what's going to turn the story? What made the difference? Verse 34. And at the end of the time, the seven years, just like God promised, I, Nebuchadnezzar, first person, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed no longer Daniel's God, I bless the Most High and praised and honor him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? But notice, what is the very first thing mentioned? how he lifted his eyes to heaven. He humbled himself, and he turned, as it were, his focus to the Lord. And he ends up trusting in the only true God. Leon Wood, in his commentary on Daniel, says this, and I quote, The phrase order shows that Nebuchadnezzar first lifted up his eyes, excuse me, his eyes to heaven, and then experienced the return of his understanding. If this chronological sequence was not intended, one would expect the two phrases to have been reversed in order. The lifting up of Nebuchadnezzar's eyes likely constituted the initial phase of the return of his understanding. But the full return did not come until after that had been done, signifying that the humility and sense of dependence thus symbolized was necessary before restoration could be granted. The insanity had been sent, especially because the king had been proud. And now before the illness could be entirely removed, there had to be the indication that pride had been taken away. The fact is stated above that the person suffering from boanthropy can still have a sense of self and God is probably what made this gesture possible prior to the full return of Nebuchadnezzar's understanding. Notice he finally humbles himself. You know, it's kind of like, if you could illustrate it, it's like a parent with a child or a teacher with a student. You know, when you give them a command, you watch their eyes, and they look at you like, who's going to drop their eyes first? I'd always look at my kids and answer like this. And until they went, you lost if you bowed first. And you look at them until they finally bow. And God says, we're going to let you for seven years act like a beast. Live like a beast. Be in a state of insanity, as it were, until finally you lift your eyes to heaven. 
You finally humble yourself and acknowledge the God of heaven. And as you do, then his thinking returns. You know, I don't know how many times I've even heard carnal believers tell me. You know, I lived in Carnality. I was wasting my life. I was going my own way. I was doing my own thing. Finally, I got to the end of myself. And finally, I turned to the Lord again. I said, what was your problem? He says, I got dumb. That's what they would say. I was dumb. And finally, I turned to the Lord. And you know what? The Lord then allows your reasoning to start to clear up. You start to take in the word of God. Divine viewpoint starts to replace that human viewpoint. Because when you're not focused on Jesus Christ, dear friends, everything is out of focus. And once you begin to focus there, he begins to clear it up. You know, someone told me yesterday, well, you know, hindsight, it's 2020. And I said to her, well, not necessarily. It might be 2040 yet. Because even in hindsight, we don't always see things as clearly as we ought. But obviously, God now can begin to clear it up. And that's exactly what happens. Nebuchadnezzar lifted my eye. Nebuchadnezzar lifted my eyes to heaven. And my understanding returned to me. And you know what? I bless the Most High. And I praise and honor him who lives forever. Wow. 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 You know, as I think of looking to heaven, I think of Isaiah 45, 20. Where God says, look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. And we know, well, in the Old Testament, they were saved by grace through faith in the Lord, apart from law, ritual, and works. We know who that Lord is today. We know that he is the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that he died for our sins and rose again. And that's the content of the gospel that we are to believe. And we are to look to him and be saved. And to be saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And number five, he then declares the results of his salvation conversion. How he was lost, how he came in contact with the truth, what truth in particular, what events surrounded all this, and now he declares the results of his salvation conversion. And the first thing we note is God's salvation affected his viewpoint of God, man, and life. At the end of time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and guess what did I do? I blessed the Most High God and praised him who lives forever and ever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. His viewpoint on God changed. <coughs> his viewpoint on man changed. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And his viewpoint on life changed. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? And you see, when you're saved by the grace of God, you know the Lord now for the first time. You know you're going to heaven for the first time, you know now something about God that you never appreciated before, his grace, and as a result, through faith in Christ alone, your viewpoint on God has changed, your viewpoint on man has now changed, and even your viewpoint on life. You know you have eternal life, and you begin to realize God has a plan for your life. As I think of eternal life, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has gone and the new has come. In other words, we begin to view people differently <laughs> than we did before. Now it's not just my friend, it's the person I'm concerned about where they're gonna spend eternity. Now it's no longer my family, it's I'm concerned about their eternal destiny. Either you're in Christ or you're not. But also, by way of result, we see that God's salvation resulted in praise to God and proclamation to man. You see, 
He's praising God here, and he's proclaiming to man the truth. And again, isn't this what happens? That as a result of being saved, you can thank God for saving you, and now you can begin to share with them the message of salvation. But in doing so, you need to be ready. You need to be ready to do that, and even trained to do that. And by the way, this Wednesday night, here we're going to have a training session on how to present the gospel once again so that you can be better equipped to do that. A third result of salvation is he recognizes God's sovereignty, restores his kingdom and honor. We read verse 36, at the same time my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom my honor and splendor returned to me, my counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, just like God said he would. And excellent majesty was added to me. And by the way, you know what we learn from this? Is that God always keeps his promises. This is just what he said would happen. And furthermore, in getting saved, you know what? Potential changes. The potential of that marriage that may be on the rocks can change. A lot of things can change. And you know what? God in his sovereignty says, you know what, Nebuchadnezzar? I'm going to restore you to your kingdom now that you remember who I am, now that you know me, now that you recognize where you got came from my grace so that you can be the kind of king I want you to be. And that's what God can do in a life. So in closing, let me make some applications and let's learn some lessons. Number one, do you have a salvation testimony? You see, you have to have a past. You have to have a time when you came in contact with the truth. You understood the truth. You believed the truth so that you know you're saved. Do you have a salvation testimony? Or are you just religious? Big difference. Question number two, as your salvation resulted in praise to God and testimony to man, are you praising the Lord each and every day for saving you and what he's done for you? And are you praying and being trained and being willing to learn even how to give out the gospel or share your testimony with others? Thirdly, have you ever written out your testimony? Well, what should it involve? What we've seen. Something regarding your past and the context of the gospel. How you came in contact with the gospel. The content of the gospel. How you personally believed in Christ as Savior. And then the results of trusting in Christ. Just like we've seen in Nebuchadnezzar's testimony, though the details are different in yours. I would again encourage you, if you've never done this, take some time to do this. Fourthly, what do we learn about God from this real story? And this is what's really important, friends. We learn he is sovereign. And you are not. He's the one who's in control, and even what you have is because of his grace. Number two, he is patient as he was with Nebuchadnezzar, but eventually judgment comes. And that's why if you're here today and you're not saved, don't put off that decision that can change your destiny. For now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Thirdly, we learn he is gracious and wanting to save you and then use you to glorify himself. And even if you're a believer, you need to remember all that you have is by his grace. And he has a plan for your life, and he wants to use you as an ambassador for Christ. And fourthly, we learn that he is faithful. He always keeps his word. Everything the dream indicates, everything the interpretation communicated, came to pass exactly like God said it would. Exactly like Daniel testified. And God always keeps his promises, friends, whether it's his salvation promises or his Christian life promises. So that is why we need to mix it with that. 
And lastly, what do we learn about pride from this real story? What do we learn about pride? What a problem it is, isn't it? We learn again the truth we've been learning throughout. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But in order to do that, oftentimes he has to humble us in order to give us that grace. So what are our choices again? Be humble or be humble. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again for your wonderful grace, this incredible testimony, how you weren't willing that an arrogant, Gentile, Babylonian king would perish, but that you did work in his heart. You used a believer to communicate to him the truth, and by your grace, we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. Amazing. And we know he didn't deserve it at all. In fact, they said he was incredibly cruel. And yet, Father, we know we don't deserve to go to heaven either. But because the Lord Jesus died for us and paid for our sins completely and rose from the grave, you have offered and given to us the gift of salvation the moment we turned our eyes towards heaven, the moment we humbled ourselves, as it were, and admitted not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to your mercy, you alone can save us. So that we trusted in the work of your Son. And now we have great reason for praise. Now we have great reason to proclaim to others the gospel. And we have great reason to believe your promises and see what you now can do in our life that you were wanting, but we were unwilling to let you do previously. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your sovereignty. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you that you are our God, and there is none like you. We thank you in Jesus' name.